Welcome and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is a fantastic Wednesday here in Michigan and a fantastic day to see our Tigers take game three of the ALDS. But on top of all that, it's also a fantastic day to learn more about Medicare, brush up on everything you might have forgotten since the last time you went through an AEP, and make sure you're aware of all of those kind of intricacies that can, uh, can or may trip you up going forward. So we humbly call this session Medicare Expertise, and hopefully by the end of today's session, you'll feel one step closer to being an expert in Medicare. My name is Randy Lover, Growth Marketing Manager here at Action Benefits, and I'm happy to welcome you and facilitate most of today's session here today. We'll also have members from our individual uh, team on the line here to help answer any questions that uh, come up today and that I can't give you a great answer to right away. So let's go ahead and get started with today's session. Three things I want to help you be aware of here today before you dive into AEP. One, we're going to look at some special cases where a beneficiary can enroll in Medicare. So what happens outside of their IEP and make sure that we're aware of all of those uh, intricacies there. Second, we're going to look at uh, late enrollment penalties and figure out how they're calculated, but also more importantly, how to avoid them as you consult with your clients going forward here. And third, we'll take a look at the way in which Medicare coordinates and coexists with both private carriers and private insurance, as well as some public programs out there, so you can uh, advise your clients appropriately coming up in this AEP or whenever they age into Medicare. Before we get started, though, I told you a little bit about me and what we're going to do here today. I'd also love to know a little bit more about you. Which of these statements best describes you? And please put the letter of the answer in the chat. Is it A, you're brand new to this market? B, you have experience in this market, in the Medicare market, but you're new to working with action? C, you have some experience with action in this market, but could use a refresher? Or is it D, you're a seasoned pro, and you just love spending time with action? You rolled out of bed today and said, Medicare, Randy, two of my favorite things. I got to be there this morning. Go ahead and let me know what you're thinking in the chat here. See a good mix coming in. A reminder that you can choose to chat either directly to me or directly or so everyone can see it by using the drop down on the top of your chat window. See a good mix of folks who are brand new to this market. Uh, great. Good. Glad to have you along here today. Hope this is a fruitful session for you. For those of you who are here for the refresher, well, you're also in the right place. And Ashley, for you being new to action, well, a special welcome to you here as well. Uh, no one said they love spending time with me here today, but I'm going to assume that it's all true, that you do love spending time with me. Um, so I'll, I, I'll, I won't take that personally. Let's go ahead and move forward here in today's session. So let's take a look at enrollment opportunities, how you'll get, uh, how your enrollees can get into Medicare as they're going forward. So uh, there are no fewer, right, to keep things simple in Medicare, there's no fewer than five different enrollment opportunities your folks have to get into Medicare here. First of all is the initial enrollment period. That enrollment period is, of course, built for your beneficiaries who are aging into the program or turning 65. And during that time, they can enroll in parts A and B and C and or D as appropriate. And that period, as you all know from uh, kind of the, our Medicare introduction class, that period lasts for a seventh month window, three months, uh, last, lasting three months before the sixth birthday and ending three months after the month of their 65th birthday. There's also the general enrollment period, which is a little less common, but you also may see some uh, enrollment coming up here in the first quarter of the year, really built for individuals who built the uh, who missed their initial enrollment period. And during that time, folks can enroll in parts A and or B as appropriate. And that runs yearly from January 1st through March 31st. When we look at special enrollment periods, uh, generally there's other cases where this can apply, but most often you'll encounter it when you're looking at someone who has previous employer-based coverage. So they're losing group coverage and they're trying to figure out what's gonna happen with Medicare next. During uh, this special enrollment period, they can enroll in parts A and or B and C or D as appropriate here as well. And they have that eight month window from the termination of employer coverage to get inside. 
Also coming up here is AEP, your annual election period, uh, built currently for those who folks are who are already enrolled in a Medicare plan, uh, whether original Medicare or in Medicare Part C or D. Uh, during this time, they can enroll in C or D if they did not do so during their initial enrollment period and change their Part C or D plans. And that period, as you all know, comes from October 15th through December 7th, so just around the corner here. And also, we should be aware of this one, and I suspect that you're going to see a lot of folks uh, take advantage of this one this year because of all the changes that might have happened in their plans that they've overlooked. But there's also the Medicare Advantage open enrollment period, which is only geared toward folks who are either in a regular MA plan or an MAPD. During that MA enrollment period, they have the opportunity to make a one-time change to their plan. So it's not like AEP, right, where there is only, um, where the last tap in is the one that counts. During MA OEP, they've got one shot to make a change, one shot to find the right plan that fits for them. And uh, that period, of course, also runs during the first quarter, January 1st through March 31st. Danny, excellent question. The effective date for GEP is the first of the next month. And I'll tell you more about that coming up. <clears throat> um, so, but before we do that, let's talk a little bit about what happens during that initial enrollment period. And not too much detail here, but want to give you some cases for you as agents and associates to be aware of uh, that where some folks might enroll automatically in Medicare Parts A and or B. Some folks might need to take some action to, no pun intended, uh, some take some action to en enroll in Medicare Parts A and B. So first things first, if you have someone that is already getting benefits from Social Security or the Railroad Retirement Board, and I'll call them RRB from here going forward, if they're already getting benefits from either place, they'll automatically be enrolled in Parts A and B starting the first of the month prior to turning um, where they turn 65. And that uh, red, white, and blue card will come in the mail to them. If they are under 65 and eligible for Medicare because they have a disability, they'll automatically be enrolled in Parts A and B after they get disability benefits from Social Security or some benefits from the RRB for 24 months. Their card would be mailed to them on, uh, for, on the first of the 25th month of collecting uh, Social Security disability benefits or RRB disability benefits. And if you have someone who is eligible for Medicare because they've been diagnosed with ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, they would automatically get parts A and B the month their social security benefits begin. And as a reminder, um, we, if we take a look at the timeline here, that Medicare card will automatically be mailed at when during the 25th month of uh, disability benefits for uh, Medicare. But there are some cases where folks will not automatically enroll in Medicare and chances are you're running into more and more of these cases because people are working longer. Uh, they're not taking Medicare when they're first enrolled, uh, eligible to take Medicare. They're working in the 65, 70, 75, right? Uh, whatever the case might be. So if they are uh, approaching age 65, but they're not getting benefits from Social Security or the RRB, it's in their interest, if appropriate, to contact Social Security three months before they turn 65 and begin the enrollment process. If they're a railroad worker, of course, they'd contact the RRB. If they're not enrolled on time, and here is the big thing here, penalties are possible, and we'll shed some light on those later on. Uh, the other thing we'd want to pay attention to is end-stage renal disease, or ESRD. Uh, for those folks, their IEP begins the month they are diagnosed with end-stage renal disease and lasts for an additional three months for them to enroll in Parts A or B. And there's some uh, special ways that their coverage can coordinate with other sources of coverage, which we'll touch on a little bit later here today. But in short, just gave you a crash course in like all the ways your IEP can go, whether it's automatic or not automatic, want to make sure you're on board with us here. In which of these cases will a beneficiary need to take action or do something like contacting Social Security or the RRB to enroll in Med Medicare Parts A and B? And there may be more than one correct answer here. Is it A, if they're already receiving Social Security benefits or RRB benefits and they're turning 65, will they need to take action? 
B, if they're not receiving Social Security benefits or RRB benefits and they're turning 65, will they need to take action? C, if they're diagnosed with ESRD or end-stage renal disease at any age, will they need to take action? Or D, if they're receiving Social Security disability benefits for more than two years, will they need to take action to take uh, parts A and or B? Please go ahead and write the letters or type the letters that you think are appropriate here keeping in mind that there may be more than one answer uh, that's appropriate. And while you're doing that, I'll take a quick sip of water. All right, I was laying it on pretty thick there. Uh, you all, or those of you who responded so far have figured out that there are in fact two answers here. They'll need to do something like contact social security uh, to enroll in Medicare in cases B and C. So if they're not already receiving those benefits and they're turning 65, they'll need to reach out to social security or RRB. And C is also true. When they're diagnosed with ESRD, Medicare doesn't just like know that, right? So they'll need to contact a local Social Security office and enroll in Medicare Parts A and or B at that time as well. The other two cases, A and D, are automatic. If they are already receiving benefits from either of those sources in turning 65, they'll automatically get Parts A and B. Uh, letter D is automatic as well. They can, they'd be automatically enrolled in Medicare after uh, receiving benefits for 24 months. If you have any questions, please feel free to put those in the chat here as well. Um, but if not, we'll go ahead and talk about that general enrollment period that Danny asked a question about a little bit earlier. And again, that general enrollment period is really targeted for folks who missed their IEP or their opp that opportunity for any reason. Uh, again, they can pick up parts A and or B, and that runs from during the first quarter of every year, January 1 through March 31. So if for some reason they did not enroll during their IEP because they missed uh, outreach or they missed advertisements and somehow like all the call centers missed them too, if they're not enrolled during IEP, they must wait till the next GEP, general enrollment period, to sign up for Part A and or B, uh, with the exception, of course, if they do qualify for a special enrollment period for uh, a variety of reasons. That general enrollment period does take place each year from January 1 through March 31. And generally speaking, uh, unless there's other circumstances which would make this not true, uh, your folks would have be subject to a late enrollment penalty for either A, B, and possibly D here as well. Uh, but no matter when they enroll in their, that window, and to answer Danny's question earlier, uh, that they're enrolled in Medicare coverage, so whether they choose Part A, Part A and B together, it's going to be effective the first month after enrollment. So if you have someone that enrolls on March 15th, they'll have Medicare Parts A and or B effective on April 1. If they, if you have someone that enrolls on February 3rd, their Medicare becomes effective on March 1. I also want to talk briefly about the special enrollment period here, and I won't touch every case for special enrollment periods, but want to talk briefly about how you can take advantage of um, and what, how you might work with folks who have who are losing their group coverage or are choosing to uh, retire from their group coverage or their group health plan. Again, this is an opportunity for those folks to pick up parts A or B, and they do have that eight-month window from when their co employer coverage terminates. Uh, not necessarily when they lose, quit employment or they lose employ employment, but from whenever their coverage terminates. So there are some things that kind of, especially in this case of losing group coverage, that can impact eligibility here. So you, they are eligible or may be eligible for a special enrollment period if the beneficiary or their spouse is actively employed and their employer group health plan has 20 or more members, or if they are disabled and working for an employer or group with more than 100 employees. They may be eligible for a special enrollment period if they are working overseas and come back, as they're volunteering in a foreign country and they come back, that may grant them an SEP if they missed their IEP for any reason. But there are two really common cases I want to make sure that we stress when you don't have an SEP. If your full, uh, beneficiary, your enrollee, has retiree coverage that is not a Medicare Advantage plan, it's just like a group Medicare Advantage plan, it's just a... Um, 
retiree benefit, that is not considered active employment, right? So when they leave that retiree plan, that would not grant them a special enrollment period. Uh, or if they have COBRA coverage, right? So they leave employment, they elect COBRA coverage. That COBRA coverage is, does not meet the threshold for active employment either. So just being on COBRA would not grant them an SEP either, nor would the exhaustion of those COBRA benefits. And you do not, again, get an SEP uh, when the beneficiary is eligible for Medicare based on uh, ESRD. Instead, you'd use the ESRD uh, initial enrollment period to secure Medicare coverage there. Should point out, though, that that special enrollment period can be taken advantage of uh, in these two cases. You can uh, take advantage of that special enrollment period when you're still covered by your group health plan, inclusive of retiree benefits. And you can use that plan within eight months of the loss of coverage or employment, whichever comes first. Um, just to check in quickly, uh, there are some other timelines that we want to be aware of with other SEPs aside from when you can enroll in Parts A or B. Remember that Part B SEP lasts eight months from the loss of coverage date. But if for any reason they lose Part D coverage or they lose Part D creditable coverage, which could be a real fact of life for folks coming up this AEP with all the changes coming to Medicare Part D benefit, if they lose creditable coverage, they'd have 63 days from the loss of that coverage date to choose a Part D plan to avoid uh, LEP or secure another source of coverage there. And same is true of Part C. If they lose a uh, Medicare Advantage plan for any reason or an MAPD, they'd have 63 days from that loss of coverage to enroll in their plan. So a lot of stuff. Want to check in with what you know and then introduce my partner in crime here today. Um, which of the following statements is true regarding the general enrollment period or the GEP? Is it A, beneficiaries are eligible to enroll at any time in Medicare throughout the calendar year? B, that period is designed for beneficiaries who may have missed their initial enrollment period? Or C, the period lasts for eight months from the uh, end of any employer-sponsored medical care? Go ahead and put your answer in the chat here and... Uh, We'll give you a few moments to do that. Then we'll introduce my partner in crime who's joining us here today. I mean, not actual crime, I guess. Just like we're talking together. All right. Looking at GEP, of course, it's designed for folks who have missed their initial enrollment period. Um, really built, again, for folks who need to pick up Medicare a little bit later on in life or have an opportunity to pick up Medicare a little bit later on in life. Um uh, Je Debbie Brown joined us here during that last segment. Want to introduce Debbie. She is uh, one of our account coordinators, our individual team, and our resident Medicare expert. Debbie, want to give you a chance to say hi before we get started. Good morning, everybody. Um, hope everybody is well. Um, as you gear up for AEP, we're here with all your answers that you have to the questions you have, I guess. And um, yeah, we're ready to go. All right. And Debbie, from what you've heard so far, anything that folks need to uh, be aware of around uh, IEP, GEPs, SEPs, anything that you want to bring to their attention before we go forward? Yeah. Keep in mind that if you have clients that have not enrolled in Part B and at the time that they should have, um, they actually can go in even now and, and enroll, but their effective date won't be until 2-1. I've had a couple of calls. Actually, we've had quite a few where the clients realized they never got part B. They thought they were going to get it like in the next couple of months. And they were shocked to see that they got a 2-1 effective date. So keep in mind, if they're past that um, initial enrollment period for A and B, they can actually go in the, I would do it now so that they're ready because I know in January, they're going to be packed um, getting people enrolled and it's going to take longer to get that part B. So that's one of the things that keep in mind um, that they can do at this time. So, um, and, you know, to Dan's question, the, they changed that rule a couple of years ago. They now do the next month. So if you do enroll, do enroll in January, you're going to have a February 1st. If it's February, it's March. And then of course, if it's March, it's um, going to be April. So those are key factors. All right. Thank you, Debbie, for joining us here today and look forward to you sharing your expertise throughout today's session. Let's go ahead and talk a bit about 
AEP that's coming up next year, briefly. And again, this period is really built for people that are already on uh, original Medicare at least, and it's really have a lot of flexibility to maybe pick up Part C or D if they didn't do so at first, or take a look at their Part C or D plans and figure out whether or not it's meeting their needs and or maybe find one that does. And again, that period runs every year, as you know, from October 15th through December 7th. So here's a, a quick recap of things that folks can do during uh, AEP. Of course, you can go from original Medicare to a Medicare Advantage plan, whether that's an MA or an MAPD. You can go from a Medicare Advantage plan back to original Medicare. And some folks uh, may want to do that, right? As they're taking a look at things, they go back to original Medicare. And maybe they want to go the Medicare supplement route um, if they can get through underwriting and find a premium that, look, that works for them. Uh, they might want to switch from one Medicare Advantage plan to another Medicare Advantage plan. And you may have a lot of that business going on as uh, folks are hearing about what's happening in there with their benefits. They've looked at their ANOX or hopefully they've looked at their ANOX by now and said, hey, wait a minute, things are different here. Uh, and they're coming to you for help, trying to find a plan that fits for them. Um, maybe they uh, want to join or pick up a drug card for the first time. They're able to do that here as well. They can switch to drug, uh, drug plans uh, in this case, and they can drop that prescription drug coverage completely if they so choose during AEP, although for a variety of reasons, we would not recommend they do that. But it is an option that they technically have throughout the period. We should note that anything done during this period from October 15th through December uh, 7th, no matter whether you write it on October 15th or November 15th or December 7th, all those changes happen on October, sorry, January 1st. Should also talk a bit about the Medicare Advantage open enrollment period, and it's right there in the name. That period is really built for your Part C enrollees or those who already have a Medicare Advantage plan. And during that time, they can make a one-time change to that Medicare Advantage plan. And again, this also runs concurrently with GEP during the first quarter of the year. We should call out that there's certain things they can do during these times and certain things they can't do during these times. So, of course, they could change their MA or MEPD plan to join a different one. That's certainly on the table. They could, at this point, return to original Medicare with or without a PDP. So, if they leave their MA plan and go back to original Medicare, they can't pick up a PDP at that point. If they're enrolled uh, in an MAPD during their IEP and change to another Medicare plan, uh, they can or go back to original Medicare within that first three months of having Medicare here as well. Should point out that only one app counts during this period, so it's not like uh, AEP where the last app in wins. You only get one shot to get it right during this period. We should also be careful to point out, and you should be careful to point out to your beneficiaries, that if you only have original Medicare during the first quarter of the year, you cannot decide during uh, January, February, or March to pick up an MA or an MAPD plan at that point, nor can you make any changes to your Part D coverage at that point. Uh, the MAOEP is only built for your Medicare Advantage enrollees. So a significant difference between AEP and the MA open enrollment period is, which is the following, a, beneficiaries have more flexibility in purchasing prescription coverage during AEP. B, beneficiaries have more flexibility in purchasing prescription coverage during OEP. Or C, beneficiaries may only return to original Medicare during MA open enrollment. Which of those is true? And there is only one that is true, if that helps. And yep, seeing some uh, A's come in here. Beneficiaries have more flexibility in purchasing prescription coverage during AEP, right? They can make more changes there. Uh, Debbie, anything to add about key differences between uh, AEP and Medicare OEP or Medicare Advantage OEP uh, before we go forward? Uh, no, you pretty much had it covered, but I do want to mention, I know we're going to be busy during AEP, but do not wait until MAOM. AOEP to make any plan changes for your client. I know some agents are going to be real busy, um, think that, oh, well, we'll just wait for MAOEP to make any changes. It's not advised to do that because remember, whatever plan they go into, 
during that period is a plan that they have to stay with for the rest of the year. So use your AEP as a time to make the plan changes correctly. Um, this is really important, um, but everything else um, is good. All right, thank you. Let's talk a little bit about ESRD. Um, you like the are encountering folks and encountering more and more folks who may be eligible for Medicare because of ESRD. Want to talk a little bit about uh, their ability to enroll in the program. So let's follow, if you will, a hypothetical journey. Uh, supposing someone gets diagnosed with ESRD, once they begin dialysis treatments, a three-month waiting period also begins along with that. Um, that three-month waiting period can be waived if your enrollee meets two conditions. The first is they've got to be participate in a home dialysis training program, which is offered by a Medicare-approved facility. And second, a doctor must uh, certify that they expect training to be finished and the patient can administer uh, dialysis on their own during those first three months. Uh, during uh, months one to three of dialysis treatments, uh, if your beneficiary has one, their employer group health plan will continue providing Medicare coverage here. Uh, they're on the hook for whatever their assigned uh, percentage is there. But from month four onward, you know, your EGHP or your employer group health plan is responsible for coverage until that first day of month four when Medicare benefits kick in. On the first day of month four, a 30-day coordination period begins, or sorry, 30-month coordination period begins. During that time, the EGHP is continued paying as a primary payer in that case. Mecondary, or Medicare may pay as a secondary payer here. An individual can lose Medicare eligibility 12 months after their last dialysis treatment ends or 36 months after they receive a kidney transplant. However, coverage can be extended if a beneficiary uh, needs to resume dialysis treatments or receives a transplant. Uh, coverage can be extended again if another transplant is received within 36 months of the first. I um, should also point out that there is a Part B, uh, a slimmed down Part B benefit that only uh, is intended for those with ESRD. And really what it's built for is covering those immunosuppressive drugs beyond that original 36 month period. Folks can be eligible for that uh, slimmed down version of Part B only if they were uh, previously had an organ transplant if they and if they have no other health coverage with that immunosuppressive benefit to treat, um, you know, to provide anti-rejection drugs, those sorts of things. This new benefit does have reduced premium can, uh, compared to the whole hog Part B, but it's still based on income and tax filing status, so you may still see uh, folks subject to IRMA there. And it all does only cover their immunosuppressive drugs with no other Part B services included in that. Um, because of that, it's not a substitute for full health coverage, and it is still eligible for IRMA. So suppose, for example, that a client of yours is diagnosed with ESRD and has begun dialysis treatments. The client's not currently covered by an employer group health plan, so which of the following statements are true? And there are two of them. Is it A, there will be a three-month waiting period for Medicare benefits to begin, B, a three-month waiting period can be waived or may be waived if a doctor certifies the patient can self-administer dialysis, and, or C, the client is not eligible for Medicare until they turn 65. Which of those are true? Okay, seeing some folks kind of split here. Uh, some splits between A, B, and there is a, there, uh, oh, to correct ourselves to, to A and B here as well. Okay, so A is absolutely true. There is a three month waiting period for Medicare benefits to begin. And B is also true. You can waive that three month waiting period if the doctor certifies that uh, the patient can self administer the di di their dialysis treatments. C is not true. Uh, you can be eligible for, e for Medicare because of ESRD at any age that you have ESRD. Uh, Debbie, anything to add here before we talk about LEPs? Nope, you pretty much covered everything on that. That's good. All right, thank you. So let's talk about LEPs. It's important uh, for your client's financial health to avoid them. So, uh, and 
they'll want to make sure they're getting sound advice from you. So I want to make sure you're all brushed up on these before uh, you're out there in this, hitting the streets and pounding pavement, talking to folks this AEP. Um, so let's talk about part A LEP and B, to be honest, this isn't very common because there's a, you know, the vast majority of folks who are eligible for part A and enroll in part A are eligible for premium free part A, but there are some cases where um, folks may not be eligible for premium free part A and that's where this applies. Uh, if, so for Part A, again, the, part, the penalty only applies if the person doesn't sign up during their AEP, during their IEP rather, and does not qualify for premium free Part A, which is only granted when a beneficiary or their spouse pays Medicare taxes long enough while working for their 40, 40 quarters or 10 years. It doesn't have to be continuous, by the way. That penalty is calculated by adding 10% fee to the base premium for each month and that penalty is charged for double the amount of time the beneficiary was supposed to be enrolled, but wasn't. So if you waited a full year to sign up, they'll pay 10% each uh, month for Part A for 24 months. Uh, so a quick example of that in 2023, for example, the Part A premium, uh, you know, it is prorated for a person uh, depending on whether they've worked third, less than 30 quarters or more than 30 quarters here. So in 2023, for example, uh, that premium was $506 per month. Those who have uh, between 30 and 39 quarters of coverage can buy Part A at a reduced premium uh, rate, which is $278. But that, two, that money does get tacked on uh, if they are, are paying for an LEP. Also want to talk briefly about the Part B LEP here as well. This is one you definitely want to make sure they avoid because it is a lifetime penalty. Um, and again, with some exceptions, if they are, uh, you know, unless they're eligible for an SEP, they could be hit with this Part B late enrollment penalty here as well. That penalty is calculated as a 10% increase to their premium for each full 12-month period enrollment was delayed. And again, it can be a lifetime penalty for at least as long as they're enrolled in Part B. So let's take a look at our uh, friend Opal here. Uh, say her initial enrollment period ended in December 2019, but she waited till uh, March 2022 to enroll during the general enrollment period. Her coverage, of course, started April 1st, 2022, but that Part B premium penalty is 20% of the standard premium, and she'll have to be paid for it as long as she keeps Part B. Now, we should keep in mind, though, that's a 27th month gap between December 2019 and March 2022. So she's not, so there's only two full 12 month periods inside that. She, that's why she only gets a 20% surcharge there and not a 23 or a 24% surcharge based on that 27 months. Also want to make sure you're aware of Part D LEPs here as well. And especially if you're working in the employer group market, want to make sure you're aware of this coming forward because uh, there could be a good chance group health plans are not offering creditable drug coverage as effective the first of the year. So your enrollee would need to pick up maybe a standalone Part D or look at in other options to make sure they have creditable coverage going forward. So if your beneficiary uh, does not enroll in Part D when they're first eligible, or they have a gap in creditable drug coverage longer than 63 days, they will be assessed a Part D late enrollment penalty. That is determined by multiplying the 1% of the national ba base premium by the number of months they were uncovered, rounded the nearest dime, and that gets tacked on to their monthly premium. And again, that's a lifetime penalty. It's in, in effect as long as the beneficiary is enrolled in Part D. So if we looked at Tariq care, for example, say he's currently eligible for Medicare and his IEP ended on March 31st, 2019. He didn't have any drug coverage from another source and didn't join by May 31st and instead joined during an open enrollment period that ended December 7, 2021. His drug coverage was effective on January 1st, 2022. Since he was without creditable coverage from June 21 through on December 22, his penalty is applied in 2022 when he starts coverage. So his new monthly penalty would be 31% of the national base premium of that year, which was $33.06 or 1025 each month. 
Since the penalty is always running to your nearest dime, he's going to pay 10 30 each month in addition to his monthly premium. So what that looks like is he's got the, his, uh, the number of months uncovered times the base premium of that year equals 1025, rounded up to the nearest dime is 1030, and that's what he's assessed for payments in um, 2021. But wait, there's more, right? That national base premium is recalculated every year. And spoiler, folks, it never goes down. So it gets more expensive year over year. So if he were to look at the next year, right, and he looks at 31% of the base premium of the next year, it comes up to 1015, rounded up to 1020, uh, he'd be in a uh, subject to a $10.20 LEP on top of his monthly premium uh, for that as well. So it's always a good idea to pick up and make sure you have credible drug coverage at any time. Key difference here is that only the Part A penalty one is the one that drops off. Parts B and D will never drop off if your beneficiaries get hit with them. So want to make sure they always have credible coverage and pick up Part B when they are able. Hey, there's a good question to ask. In most cases, the only late enrollment penalty that will end while the beneficiary is enrolled in Medicare is it A, the Part A LEP, B, the Part B LEP, or C, the Part D LEP, which one will drop off over time? Absolutely right. Only the Part A penalty will drop off over time. Um, but even then, if you're hit with the Part A LEP because you're paying premium for Part A, that's still a lot of money that you'd rather avoid. 20% of $500 is still more than I, I'd like to pay for my health care every month. Uh, Debbie, anything to add here about LEPs before we march on? Um, well, I did put the um, Part D calculator in the chat. So if you guys want to use the calculator, keep in mind that Part D penalty started in June of 2006. That's number one. Uh, number two, if you, um, we get a lot of questions of why my client got this form. Keep in mind, if your client is past age 65, they're losing group. They're now signing up for uh, MAPD or PDP. PDP plan, they will receive a declaration of prior prescription drug form. They have to fill that out. If they do not fill that out, they will get an LEP once that's been assessed to the carriers um, and is put on their premium, then they will have to do an appeal, which can take up to 60 to 90 days to get removed. So very important to let the carrier know that the members had prior credible drug coverage when they turned age 65. Let us know if you have any questions. Absolutely. All right, thank you, Debbie. And let's press on. I don't see any questions waiting for us. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Medicare supplement. Um, you may not be writing a ton of these or changing plans during AEP coming up, but wanna make sure you're aware of those enrollment opportunities that folks can have for Medicare supplement plans uh, if they decide that maybe that's an option they want to explore here this year. So when someone applies for a supplement policy, they either have a guaranteed issue period or a non-guaranteed issue period. What that means is depending on um, when they apply, will determine whether or not they have to go under, uh, undergo medical underwriting and the prices within their policy could change if they have some conditions that appear during that underwriting process. And some carriers can and will deny coverage uh, if you're applying outside that guaranteed issue range. But if the beneficiary does apply during this supplement open enrollment period or this guaranteed issue period that's on the top of the screen, that is a six month window that begins when beneficiaries are age 65. Um, but to be eligible for their Medicare supplement, they must also have enrolled in parts A and B. If they do happen to lose employer group coverage or other periods where uh, special circumstances could apply here, like uh, their plan goes bankrupt and leaves the state, or they've changed service areas, your beneficiary moves service areas, um, they may be eligible for GI rights in that uh, circumstance as well. But outside of that six month window, they have non-guaranteed issue, uh, or it's not a guaranteed issue policy, and beneficiaries can be medically underwritten for, uh, depending on the carrier, things like height and weight, right, and BMI. They could look at things like 
uh, do you smoke? Do you have cancer? So on and so forth. Um, or do you have a history of cancer and choose to knock out coverage based on that or choose to uprate your clients based on their responses there too. And again, some carriers can and will deny coverage if they're applying outside of that GI period. Should point out that Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan does not, uh, is a guaranteed acceptance carrier. Um, so they may, may medically underwrite your folks and uprate them, but they will not reject them. So if you've got nowhere else to go for a MedSup option, Blue Cross can work. Other carriers though can and do um, exercise their right to deny coverage in those instances. So generally speaking, the best way to avoid LEPs and ensure access to a variety of medical plans at a the most affordable price points is which of the following. Is it A, sign up during the initial enrollment period, B, sign up during the initial enrollment period, or C, sign up during the initial enrollment period? So absolutely right. Being a little cheeky here with you this morning that uh, all of these are, are true, right? You uh, the, the first best time to sign up for Medicare is during that initial enrollment period. The second best time to sign up for Medicare, if your circumstances allow, if you're an employer group health plan, it uh, would be when that plan is ending and you're in that SEP there. But when in doubt, that initial enrollment period can be a really good fit for folks. Um, with the caveat, you'd want to be mindful of whether or not they're participating within HSA, because once you enroll in Bar Medicare Part A, you can no longer contribute to that um, health savings account, but you can make withdrawals. Um, Danny, I'm going to read your question for a minute, but want to see if Debbie has an opportunity to weigh in on anything we've talked about uh, with MedSup here. Nope, not at this time. Um, one thing I do want to say is, so Priority Health, most of your carriers' effective new plans or renewal is January 1st. Keep in mind, Blue Cross is always 4-1. And we will not have any material for Blue Cross until after 2-1. So when you put in your sup supply requests, keep in mind, you're only going to get 2024 supplemental information. Um, also, when you fill out the, this is so important, we're finding a lot of times this isn't being done. If you're filling out uh, medical information on an application, please check with your client. If they are taking blood pressure pills, then that means they've got heart issues. So putting no, no to no heart issues and then having blood pressure or high cholesterol prescriptions, that is going to kind of be looked down on and could cause an issue. So be very careful. Right, and specifically Blue, Blue Cross or any carrier would operate the client at that point, right? So they... They wouldn't get the rate you, uh, you you advertised when you were consulting with them. So be mindful of that. To Danny's question, um, well, I get the, the best way to, to answer that question is in that in that case, insurers are acting a lot like the cable company, right? Um, there are some carriers out there that have a reputation for having low rates when you're 65, 66, 67, maybe up to 68. But then when you hit 69 or 70, all of a sudden they're you know, that the rates climb a little bit. Um, some of that probably has to do with the risk of insuring an older an older population. Um, some of that has to do with, you know, the, the, the cable company phenomenon that you point out there, right? Uh, people know that it's, or carriers know that sometimes it's hard to switch coverage. Uh, so they want to sink their hooks in early, right? Um, and and try and get folks in that way. It's kind of one of the uh, you know the the more unsavory parts of the industry that we work in, but it's a reality of of the industry that we work in here as well. But let's focus on education. Let's focus on the bright side of life and how Medicare does work with other things uh, going forward. So let's take a few moments to talk about how Medicare does coexist and coordinate with some sources of public and private coverage. So just as a reminder, Medicare, um, so there are times when your clients will have more than one source of insurance. Uh, each type of insurance there is called a payer, and that's important when you go to read Medicare's secondary payer rules. That's what we're talking about here is different sources of coverage. 
When there is more than one payer, Medicare does have a set of benefit rules, of coordination benefit rules that decide who's going to pay first. Is it Medicare? Is it me? Is it you? Uh, what's going to go on here? And sometimes there's even a tertiary payer um, or a third payer that's uh, in the works here as well. Best way to memorize or best way to get a hold of all this is take a screenshot of what's on your screen here um, or, or quickly jot this down. Again, I'll send you the recording a little bit later on tomorrow morning. Um, but generally, Medicare does play nicely with a lot of sources, both public and private coverage. Let's run that uh, through that quickly with you. Say, for example, someone has a retiree plan, not a group Medicare Advantage plan, but just a retiree plan through their employer. That can coexist with Medicare and Medicare will be primary so long as the uh, uh, enrollee doesn't have any excluding conditions like the black lung or something like that, where the employer would in that case take on primary responsibility or the, the retiree plan rather would take on primary responsibility. If, they're in, if they or the enrollee or their spouse is enrolled in employer group health plan or an EGHP, of course those coexist with Medicare. Medicare will be primary if the employer has less than 20 employees, but if the employer has more than 20 employees, Medicare becomes secondary, the employer's plan becomes primary. If someone is under 65, disabled, and on an employer group health plan that does coexist with, med exist with Medicare and Medicare will be primary, if the employer has less than 100 employees, that should say, uh, if they have more than 100 employees, the Medicare will pay secondary in that case. If you have end-stage renal disease with an employer group health plan that does coexist with Medicare, Medicare will be primary, but only after that 30-month coordination of benefits period that we talked about a little bit earlier on. Medicare and Medicaid do exist uh, pretty nicely together in most cases here. Medicare pays primary, so Medicare is going to pay that 80%. Medicaid comes up, picks up the remaining 20% for most cases. Should point out that balanced billing is illegal for qualified beneficiaries. And we talk more about DSNPs and how Medicare and Medicaid interact in another training. I'm uh, happy to share that with you or give you your own little personal show if, if you like for that as well. Should also talk about uh, individual coverage on the marketplace. That does not coexist with Medicare. So Medicare doesn't pay anything in that case. Uh, when you are eligible for eligible for Medicare, this, that does disqualify you for any tax credits or other subsidies, including CSRs on the marketplace. And that's Uncle Sam's way of saying, hey, you're uh, eligible for Medicare. There's another way for you to get coverage here. Um, so kind of a quick snapshot of how things mostly play together here. A lot of agents have told me they found a chart like this helpful to keep at their desks, especially as they are uh, consulting with clients and trying to figure out what coverage options make sense for them going forward. Suppose you have a client, Hector. He is 64 in nine months, and he's employed with a small eight-person web design firm. He's enrolled in that firm's group health plan and will enroll in original Medicare during his IEP. He wants to continue working till he's 70. Which of the following statements will be true regarding Hector's medical coverage while he is still working? Is it A, Medicare will be the primary payer for any medical expenses he incurs? B, Medicare will be secondary payer for any inpatient hospital expenses he incurs? Or C, there will be a 30-month coordination period between the EGHP and Medicare? In this case, uh, A is correct. Medicare is going to pay primary because the group is smaller than, smaller than 20. If the group were larger than 20, Medicare would pay secondary. Um, but that number of 20 is so important to remember, right? Because it does influence whether it's appropriate for the person to pick, our, pick up parts A and B right away, whether they can wait a little bit, depending on their employer's coverage rules. Lots of things to figure out as you're talking to clients there. Debbie, anything to add here? Yeah, I mean, just make sure if your group is under 20, you've got to get with those people that are turning Medicare age to get onto A and B because, yeah, will their claims be paid? Sure, but down the road, they're going to get a Medicare demand letter and could cause a lot of um, expense to the client, maybe to the group. So very important. Um, just make sure you follow your groups, make sure they're doing what they need to do.
They go up or under 20. Um, there, Debbie, what is the, the rule? So for the rule, the the, generally the rule of thumb is number one, you have to have at least 20 or more employees at least 20 weeks out of the year. So what they normally do is look at where the group is at, like the six months into the year. If the last six months of the year, the group is showing over 20, then the following year, that group will be considered as over 20. Um, if the group is goes under 20, there's a good possibility the group will that now be considered as a small group under 20 so that, so that you're going to have to get with the carrier, see how they look at it, um, and possibly provide quarterly wage detail reports, provide proof that there was more. And this is full-time and part-time employees. So it's, and it's not considered as, uh, counted as FTEs. So it's full-time, part-time employees, and uh, that's what they base it on. Thank you. Let's take a look at how Medicare works with some veterans coverage here as well. I know a lot of you probably serve veterans. There's veterans in your community. So I want to talk briefly about that. Um, generally speaking, the VA itself strongly recommends enrollment parts A and B when anyone becomes eligible for Medicare for three big reasons. The first is that VA health coverage isn't the same for everyone. Congress can choose to fund or not fund things uh, at um, their leisure. Some folks have uh, different VA benefits than other be benefits do, and sometimes those VA benefits can uh, slim down over time. So it's always important to have parts A and B as a safety net. Enrolling in parts A and B does greatly widen coverage options for your folks here as well. They can get treatment either under Medicare or under the VA program. They can use their VA benefits at VA centers or at a pre-authorized non-VA location, location, or they can use their Medicare benefits at anyone that accepts uh, assignment from Medicare. And Medicare may pay for non-VA covered services at a non-VA location as well. And there is a good shot, good chance rather that LEPs for Part B could apply in the future if for any reason they lose VA benefits or if um, they want more choice and options. We should point out though that there is no penalty uh, for Part D in this case because for now at least the VA coverage counts as creditable coverage. The other source of coverage your veterans may have is TRICARE for Life or TFL. Um, that is military retiree coverage. So uh, if they have uh, services that are covered by both Medicare and TFL, Medicare will be the primary payer in that case, TFL would be the secondary payer. If it is covered by TFL, but not Medicare, so uh, there's a service that only uh, the, the military retiree plan covers, TFL would pay first in that case, Medicare will pay nothing, even if TL TFL does cover it. Um, for services getting in a military hospital, though, or if they go to another federal provider for that care, uh, the TFL will pay first, and generally, will medic uh, generally Medicare will pay nothing in those circumstances. Um, so we'd want to uh, be mindful of those facts as your uh, folks are seeking coverage going forward. Also, I want to talk briefly about COBRA because this is one of the things that our routinely trips up agents want to make sure we spend a few moments with this and give Debbie a chance to weigh in on it at here as well. Remember that COBRA is uh, the stands for the Consolidated Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act, and it provides coverage for workers and their families who lose their health benefits, gives them the option to extend health coverage from their group health plan uh, for limited periods of time for circum certain circumstances. Uh, whether there's voluntary or involuntary job loss, whether they, there's a reduction in their hours worked, uh, whether there's a transition between jobs, uh, so maybe you're looking for work, or death, divorce, and other life events can also trigger COBRA rights here. In general, COBRA does only apply to employers that have 20 or more employees, and it's generally offered for 18 months, but 36 months in some circumstances. Um, say, for example, there's a death of a covered employee or an adult child turns 26 and ages out of that parent's plan or there's a divorce or legal separation. Or if the covered employee and only the covered employee becomes eligible for Medicare. There's a quick flow chart. I want to make sure you have on hand here as well to figure out what happens uh, 
in certain cases, whether you have COBRA and Medicare and, and or one or the other. So stay, uh, there's a life event that leads to COBRA eligibility. You lose employment here. If they enroll in Medicare while they're on COBRA, they would lose their uh, Med COBRA eligibility as soon as they're enrolled in Medicare. But if they were enrolled in Medicare before they chose COBRA, they could still choose COBRA at that point, even if they're only, only enrolled in Part A. But they would also need to enroll in Part B uh, to avoid any Part B LEPs. Remember that COBRA coverage isn't considered active employment. Um, so the clock starts ticking for that Part B LEP right away. Want to make sure you pick up Part D, uh, Part B as soon as uh, the the active employee coverage ends. But uh, because nothing is simple in the Medicare world, right, that Part D LEP can be avoided if you choose COBRA coverage, uh, because if that or if that COBRA coverage is creditable, it provides coverage at least as good as what Medicare would be. Uh, so moral of the story is, as soon as someone loses their group health plan, even if they do plan on taking COBRA, always important to pick up Part B here as well, because it's going to set them up uh, to avoid LEPs and so they can avoid um, work toward choosing a Medicare plan of their choice. Debbie, anything to add about COBRA before we come into the home stretch here today? Yeah, we get a lot of calls on this. Um, I mean, tons of calls. Somebody's on COBRA, they have Part A, they don't want to take Part B and they want to be on COBRA. Keep in mind, once you're on Medicare, Medicare is primary. So if you don't have Part B, you're not going to have coverage. You're going to have claim issues. There's going to be all kinds of things. Then if it goes past the eight months and you still didn't part, plan, or get part B, then you're going to have, the member is going to have to wait until general enrollment. We, I just had three cases recently. Members lost COBRA. It's on their 18th month. Here it is, September. When can they, they can't enroll in part B. The agent's calling up. And I tell them, that's right, they have to enroll and they won't get it, they'll get a 2 1 effective date. So now this member has no coverage from September until February of the following year. So it's so important. Um, most of the ones that don't want to do B is because they have that IRMA charge. Sorry, got to do it. You just got to tell your clients they have to sign up for B. It's very important. Um, COBRA coverage, medical coverage is not considered as credible. So that's why that Part B penalty will go in effect if they don't do it by A. Your drug is, but your Part B medical, the medical portion of it is not considered as credible um, medical coverage. Um, it's a good fight in, I think, Washington on this. They're trying to change that ruling, but it hasn't been changed till it's changed. Got to follow the rules. Thank you. And great points for agents to take forward. One I, I know we're at the top of the hour here. I want to make sure you have a handle on everything we talked about here today. Um, so we talked about cases where folks can enroll in Medicare. We talked about how LDPs are calculated and also how to avoid those. And we talked a bit about how Medicare can coexist and coordinate with a variety of private carriers and public programs here as well. So we talked about these enrollment periods. Feel free to grab this screenshot, post it on your cubicle. In fact, if you uh, walked around our office, you you would see this chart on nearly every individual uh, uh, desk in your individual department here as well. It's a good little reminder for you going forward. Not far behind, you'd also see this chart. Uh, you'd see this description of those LEPs. Uh, a good way to remind yourself of what those look like as you uh, take a look at consulting with your clients. And on some desks, you may also see this one, uh, remembering how the uh, Medicare coexists or coordinates with a variety of programs here. It is 11.01. I want to thank you for your time and attention here today and spending time with us. I know it's a busy time of year for everyone here. I would love for you to uh, tell us how we did today. Shortly after you leave today's session or in a follow-up email you'll get tomorrow, I will ask you to complete an evaluation. Let us know how we did here today. And we do always invite you to stay in touch with us. You can follow us on LinkedIn at the Action Benefits Company. Reach out to me at learning at actionbenefits.com or our individual team, including Debbie at individual actionbenefits.com or reach out to us at 248-356-8585. Debbie, any parting words before we uh, say goodbye to folks for the day? 
Um, no, thanks everybody for joining uh, Randy and myself. Um, as Randy said, if you have any questions, contact individual at actionbenefits.com. We have a strong team of eight people on this team that'll be here for you, especially during AEP. We hope you all have a successful AEP and uh, we're here for you. Give us a call. Thank you, Debbie, for joining us here today. Thank you again to the audience for joining us here today. I, I want to you know, say on behalf of all of Action Benefits, uh, we appreciate your business or uh, and for spending the time with us here today. We know, again, it's a busy time of year. We look forward to helping you all out through AEP and beyond. Thank you, Ashley, for spending time with us here and Danny as well. Uh, good idea to always uh, take a look at Part B when you have some of that Susan Group coverage there. And thank you, Pamela, for the kind words as well. All right. Uh, should you have any more questions, you know where to find us. The information is there on your screen, but I know we're also a few minutes over. Uh, so, uh, and you must probably be off to other appointments and other things to do here. So please reach out to us whenever you have a question. We are here to help. Thank you and enjoy your days.